Hi guys. So today we are going to talk about how we can keep track of the different types of energy storage when we are looking at a system like the IC Hot Lab. We saw in the lab that at some points thermal energy was changing, at some points phase energy was changing. So how can we keep track of that and show it visually? And we're going to learn how to use energy bar charts. But before we talk about that, let's go back and review some of the vocab that we've already seen before, but kind of keep it fresh in our minds. So we know that the system is the thing that we are looking at, the thing we are studying at this moment. We saw this back during the mass and change lab. Remember, we talked about open systems and closed systems. Um, the surroundings are everything that is not the system. And of course, a closed system is when the system is sealed off from the surroundings and an open system is when it's able to interact with the surroundings. Now we know that of course a closed system, a perfect closed system is almost impossible, but in general you can create sort of a semi-closed system in your labs. And an open system is when <clears throat> everything is just open to the surroundings. And often um, in this unit we'll find that we are using an open system, not a closed system. All right, now in the reading that we did a couple days ago, you guys saw that energy, although it's not a physical substance like matter, it's like a substance. So we treat it like a substance. Um, one of our metaphors was that it was like data on a computer. I can transfer files and store them in different things on disks or in the cloud, but it still is the same data. Um, and then we talked about how you can transfer energy from one system to another, even though you can't, unlike data, which can be destroyed, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now, when there is an energy transfer, it will always transfer from high to low. And in this process, when we're storing energy differently, if we're storing energy um, in different types, it's not actually changing what the energy itself is, it's just changing how it is stored. So we learned about three types of energy, and I'm going to review them very quickly so that you remember. The first one is thermal energy. That was the one we spent a long time talking about last unit. And this is the energy stored in the movement of particles, otherwise known as kinetic energy. And this is what we're measuring when we measure the temperature. Then we just recently learned about phase energy when we were doing the IC Hot Lab. And this is the energy that's stored in the arrangement of particles. Now these are not chemical bonds. These are a thing we call intermolecular forces. And we're actually not going to spend a lot of time talking about intermolecular forces this year in regular chem. But if you take AP Chem, you'll learn a lot more about it. But the important thing here is that this is basically what keeps a solid a solid or a liquid a liquid or a gas a gas. These are the interactions between particles that keep them in a certain arrangement. And as you add energy to the system, then you can overcome these intermolecular forces and make them sort of less organized. So when we're talking about phase energy, the lowest phase energy is a solid. It's very stable. It has very strong intermolecular forces. Then there's a liquid. As you add energy, it becomes less organized. And then as you add more energy, you get to a gas, which has the most stored phase energy because you've added the most energy to overcome those forces. Um, and when there's a phase change, this is the type of energy that we're looking at. And then finally is chemical energy. Now this is the energy that is in the chemical bonds between the molecules. Um, now saying it's stored in the bonds is a little problematic. We'll talk about this later this year. It's not like there's sort of a magical, you know, burst of energy in chemical bonds, but what there is is potential energy in those chemical bonds. And when we rearrange uh, atoms in a molecule to form new substances, this is chemical energy. So we're not going to be talking about chemical energy this unit. So in this unit, we're just going to focus on thermal and phase energy. But in a couple units down the road, when we start talking about chemical reactions, we'll come back to this and learn more about chemical energy. All right, so how can we show this? In an energy bar chart, we basically keep track of the accounts. Remember, that was our second metaphor for energy, is it's like different types of bank accounts. We can transfer the energy like money between different accounts. Um, and this is what the bar chart looks like. So we have the system in the middle, you know, and then the 
left side is the energy before the transfer and the right side is the energy after the transfer. And then we'll use bars to show how much energy there is and arrows to show how it flows in and out. And this is easy. This is easiest to show if we use an example. So our example is a cup of hot coffee cools as it sits on the table. So our system here is going to be the thing we're looking at, which in this case is the coffee. So we'll write that in the middle. And then of course, everything else, the table, the air, all of that is the ceramics. All right, now we need to think about is chemical energy involved? We start with coffee, we end with coffee, it cooled down, it's still coffee. There's no new substances created, so no chemical energy was involved. And you know, pro tip, it's never gonna be involved this unit, but this is something you might wanna think about in a couple of units. All right, so we know we're just gonna ignore chemical energy for now, but let's think about the phase energy. Now, earlier I said solids have the least amount of phase energy um, because the stored energy is a potential energy and they, um, have a very strong bonds that don't have a lot of potential energy. So they have the least, liquids have sort of a medium amount, and gases have the most. So we are going to assign certain numbers of bars to each one based on its energy. So solids, we're just gonna give one energy bar because they have very low energy. Liquids, we're gonna give two because it's a little bit more. And gases, because it's actually quite a lot more energy, we're gonna jump up to four energy bars. So these are something you'll have to remember. Solids are one, liquids are two, gases are four. So in this case, the coffee starts as a liquid, so we're gonna give it two energy bars, and then it also ends as a liquid. So that's also two energy bars for the after. All right, now let's think about the thermal energy, the movement or temperature. So this is hot coffee cooling down. So I'm gonna give it four bars for hot coffee because it's hot and two bars for room temperature coffee. Now here's the thing about the thermal energy. Unlike the phase energy where I gave you rules, there is there are no rules here, just that it needs to be consistent and go along with the problem. So if you had decided to use three bars for hot and two bars for room temperature, that would be fine also, as long as you're consistent and you know you tend to use the same number of bars for the same temperature each time. But there's no specific rules as long as the temperature goes down. All right, so now that we've assigned our thermal and phase energy, and remember we're leaving chemical energy blank because there was no chemical change, um, let's count up our bars. So we started with six bars of energy, four for the thermal, two for the phase, and we ended with four because the phase was the same, but the thermal went down. And so this means that our system lost two bars of energy because we went six to four. So we need to show that energy leaving the system into the surroundings. And we'll show that drawing basically our two units of energy leaving the system. Now this is a place where if you chose to do the thermal energy differently, like you drew three bars instead of four, you would be showing just one um, unit of energy leaving the system. Because these energy bar charts are not like a math problem, they're more like a particle diagram. They're just showing the relative amounts. So the important thing here is that energy left the system and went into the surroundings. All right, so we're gonna do a practice one. A tray of ice cubes that's at negative eight Celsius is placed on the counter and becomes water at room temperature. So this would be a good place to pause and try to do this yourself. I'll give you some time. All right, so our system here is gonna be the ice cubes. And the phase for it starts as a solid because ice cubes are solid. So that's one bar for solid. And then it ends as a liquid. So that's going to be two bars for the phase for the after for liquid. Then we started very cold, negative eight Celsius. So I'm going to give that one bar of thermal energy. Remember, thermal energy is your choice. So you might have given it a different amount, but I'm going to do one. And then it ends at room temperature. So I'm going to say that's two bars of thermal energy which means I've started with two bars of energy and ended with four bars of energy, which means I gained two units of energy. So for my flow of energy, I need to show two units of energy coming in from the surroundings into the ice. Now remember, for the other one, we had the units going out into the surroundings with the coffee, which would make the surroundings warm. Think of coffee warming up your hand when you're holding it. 
Here, because the surroundings are losing energy to the ice, the surroundings themselves are going to get cooler. Think of holding an ice cube in your hand, your hand's going to feel cold. And that's because of that energy transfer. And that actually brings us to our last vocab for this lovely video that you're watching, and that's endo and exothermic. So an endothermic, in this case, not reaction, but an endothermic process is when energy is added to the system. So what we just saw with the melting ice cubes is endothermic. So the system is gaining energy, but the surroundings are losing energy. So in general, since you are usually a member of the surroundings, you're going to feel this as cold because you're losing energy to the system. An exothermic process is when energy leaves the system. So our first example, the cooling cup of coffee is exothermic because energy was transferred to the surroundings. And because you are usually part of the surroundings, you're going to feel an exothermic reaction as warm. All right, so that is the end of our notes for today. Please uh, write them up in your notebook and turn them in on Schoology.